All right, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you here to Washington Policy Center's 2019 Eastern Washington annual dinner event. Thank you. Because of you, this event is one of the largest events of its kind in the region and really the country. Uh, just look around you. I mean, we've packed everyone into the ballroom this evening. It's great to see so many familiar faces here tonight. Joining us tonight are more than 1,000, in fact, we have nearly 1,200 citizens, business leaders, elected officials from all across the state of Washington. Uh, here at the Davenport Grand Hotel, which, by the way, looks absolutely incredible tonight. Uh, let's thank all of the folks here at the Davenport Grand Hotel who have done a terrific job. There are also thousands more watching these uh, festivities on a tape-delayed basis on TVW throughout the state of Washington. So the, to those at home, welcome. Uh, it is truly going to be a remarkable evening. With us tonight are two great leaders, the 55th governor of the state of New Jersey, Governor Chris Christie's here. And of course we have former Secretary of Defense, a Washington native, General Jim Mattis is here with us as well. Tonight's event, along with our annual dinner events in uh, Bellevue just a, a few weeks ago, bring together more than 2,500 citizens from across the state. I think that says something about the support Washington Policy Center has in Washington State. So please give yourself a round of applause. I think it's important to get things started on the right foot, and we want to do that by recognizing all of the veterans and the active military members who we have in the room tonight. And I hope, know we have a lot of them uh, because I met a lot of them up at the uh, VIP reception. So would all of our active uh, military members and veterans please stand tonight so we can recognize you? Look at that. Thank you very much for your service. Let me now introduce our uh, Master of Ceremonies this evening. She's a familiar face and voice to many of you here in Spokane. She co-hosts the number one morning news program uh, here on radio in the Inland Northwest on uh, News Radio 590 KQNT. And she's been on the air, either TV or radio, for decades here in Spokane. Please welcome Teresa Lukens. Thank you, Chris. Make me sound so old when you say decades like that. I'm so excited to be here tonight. I'm excited to be anywhere after 6 o'clock at night. I'm usually in bed by now, and that's not even a joke. <laughs> um, some of you might know my husband, Rick Lukens. He works in sports radio. He wanted to be here tonight, but in a clash of ideology, Rick says he has a huge problem with Chris Christie. In my husband's words, quote, I'm not breaking bread with someone who chooses to support the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Go Hawks. <laughs> it is indeed an honor to be with all of you tonight to celebrate the work of WPC, to hear from our two great speakers, honor a true American hero, and enjoy some wonderful food and company. As Chris mentioned, this event has grown to one of the largest of its kind in the region and, in fact, in the entire country. And that's because of the support of all of you. So please, give yourselves a round of applause. It's also because Washington Policy Center is successful in its mission. There's a reason why more people are supporting its work. There's a reason why more media outlets, like my own, are depending on the research. We have Chris on the air every Monday morning to discuss top issues. There's a reason why some of the country's top leaders, like Governor Christie and Secretary 
um, of uh, uh, Governor Christie and Secretary Mattis fly thousands of miles to join us here on this great evening. And that's because WPC have an impact. So tonight, we celebrate that work. As we get started tonight, we would like to ask you to pull out your cell, cell phones for a couple of reasons. First of all, put them on silent, turn those ringers off, but do not put them away because we want you to jump on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, take pictures tonight, share what you hear. There are a lot of people who wish they could be here but are not. So let people know where you're at. The hashtag for this evening is hashtag WPCAD, hashtag WPCAD. We're going to begin this evening by honoring America. If you would all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Leading us in the pledge tonight will be the president of Washington Policy Center's student club at Gonzaga University, Liam Mamakunian. He is a senior studying finance and economics. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Liam. Please remain standing for our national anthem and welcome violinist Jennifer Hicks. Jennifer was born and raised in Spokane. She has performed across the world, including at the U.S. Ambassador's residence in Greece. She is the current development director for the Spokane Symphony. Thank you very much, Jennifer. You may be seated. Tonight's invocation will be given by Spokane Mayor David Condon. Mayor Condon is in his eighth and final year in office. He is a longtime friend of the Policy Center, and we're honored that he is here with us this evening. Mayor Condon. Well, welcome to Spokane and welcome to the city of choice, both to the secretary and to the governor and to so many of our friends from across the state and those of you watching this. If you would ask, or I would ask that you bow your head and join me in prayer. Lord, as we gather here tonight, I ask that you offer your guidance. I pray for you to be with us and give us the strength to follow the teachings of Philippians 2.3, which says... Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. Tonight, we pray for our leaders, that they understand at the center of collaboration is a true comfort and valuing of diversity of people, ideas, and ways of thinking. Let us not turn inward and focus on ourselves, but look outward with humility and service to others. I ask also that you watch over and protect our nation's military members and their families. Be also with those who make decisions for our military. Give them the wisdom and the discernment in everything they do. And finally, as Galatians 6-9 says, 
And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Thank you, God, for your blessings, and bless this food and those who prepared it. And God bless America. Amen. Thank you, Mayor Condon, for those inspirational words and for your leadership over the past eight years. We now have the opportunity to hear from our first speaker. To introduce Governor Christie, it is my pleasure to introduce Washington's 15th Secretary of State. First, first elected in 2012, Kim Wyman is serving in her second term and is only the second female Secretary of State in Washington history. Prior to being elected statewide, Secretary Wyman was the Thurston County Elections Director for nearly a decade and also served as Thurston County Auditor. Please welcome Secretary Kim Wyman. Well, it's truly an honor this evening to uh, be part of this. Thank you so much for being here and supporting the work of the Washington Policy Center. It is making a difference. and. Uh, your contributions and your support make the difference in policy and change, hopefully will change the direction of our state. I'm sorry, that was political, and we know that we're not political here tonight. Um, and I have a great example of that I learned this evening, and this is such a great example of the bipartisan nature by which this organization operates. A Mets fan is allowing a Yankees fan to introduce him. I'm just saying. I know I shouldn't have said that that's a political liability in the state. I shouldn't have mentioned that. But uh, I also have to tell you that I'm right now trying to be very professional and measured because I am, you know, a statewide leader. But there is the inner political geek inside of me right now going, oh, my gosh, you get to introduce Chris Christie. <laughs> saying. So I'll go back to professional because that's what I'm supposed to do. Christopher James Christie served as the 55th governor of New Jersey from, 19, excuse me, from 2010 to 2018. As many of you know, he's a bulldog, and you might have seen some of his famous confrontations on television, because he wasn't afraid to tell people what he thought and tell people the truth. In some parts of the world, we call that leadership. And during his time in office, Governor Christie emphasized issues related to fiscal responsibility, pension and health benefit reform, and education reform. He signed pension reform bills which required public employees to contribute a small percentage of their salaries towards their health care benefits. Now this one I know is going to resonate well with this room. He approved 23 new charter schools in New Jersey. In fact, this included the state's first charter school for children with autism. He also reformed the teacher tenure system in New Jersey, telling teachers they had to work slightly longer if they wanted to earn tenure, and proposing, get this, evaluations of effectiveness be used. For that, the teachers union executives accused him of launching the largest attack ever on public education. <laughs> oh, come on, that should get some sort of reaction. <laughs> wow, all right, never mind. But Governor Christie, and this is one of the reasons why I'm a big fan, also knew when to set aside party labels, working with President Obama in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy for the betterment of his state. The governor is a graduate of the University of Delaware and has a JD from Seton Hall. He is now a legal and political commentator with ABC News. And by the way, I appreciate that a lot because I find myself talking back to the television and then you say what I'm saying, so it's really good. He's also the author of this book, which I should have but don't. Oh, here we go. Wait, wait, wait for it. Okay. This book called Let Me Finish. It will be on sale at the Barnes & Noble table outside the main ballroom after the event, and the governor has agreed to sign some copies. So would you please give a warm Washington welcome to one of the biggest Bruce Springsteen fans on the planet, Governor Chris Christie.
Thank you. You know, I, I was giving a speech last week in Las Vegas, and they welcomed me out onto the stage by playing Dancing in the Dark. <laughs> and I got on the stage and I said, here's the good news, I'm not going to dance. You don't want to see that. I want to thank the Secretary of State for her really wonderful introduction. Um, yes, I am a Mets fan, which means that I learned at an early age how to deal with pain and disappointment. <laughs> I never understand why Yankee fans are angry at Met fans. What did we do? You've won like 28 World Series, we've won two. So there's no reason to be angry with us. You should feel for us. And as to our MC's husband's problem, uh, uh, you can only imagine, you know, people talk about taking on the teachers' union, taking on the other public sector unions, the budget fights they had in New Jersey, and we'll talk about some of that tonight. But the single most courageous thing I did for eight years as governor of New Jersey was to be a Dallas Cowboys fan. <laughs> Think about this now. Half of my state, the northern half, is in the New York media market, and they are mostly New York Giants fans. The southern half of my state is in the Philadelphia media market, and they are mostly Philadelphia Eagles fans. And so the one thing that brought all of them together was hating who I rooted for <laughs> in football. But I, what I'll tell you is that it also tells you, I think, a little bit about who I am. When I decided to run for governor, you know, you get political consultants and they sit at the table and they ask you all those questions they have to ask you. And some of them are sensitive and personal. And then some of them are just kind of check the box kind of questions like, what teams do you root for? And I said, well, I root for the Mets in baseball, and none of them looked up, and they're writing down. I, I root for the New York Rangers in hockey. Okay, they're going to. I root for the New York Knicks in basketball. Okay. And uh, I said, I root for the Dallas Cowboys. They went, no, 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 sir. You can't root for the Cowboys here. And I'm like, no, it's not like, a, I mean, it's a state of being. I, I am a Cowboys fan, and, and so I, I, have to, I have to root for the Cowboys. And I can tell you that it got me in more trouble than anything I ever said or did from a policy perspective in my eight years as governor was rooting for the Dallas Cowboys. But I still am, and we did beat the Seahawks in the playoffs last year. So, <laughs> sorry, I was there. She said you had to go there. Hey, you brought it up. I had no intention of going there. There were two reasons why I said yes when the Washington Policy Center invited me tonight. Reason number one is that I firmly believe that the only way towards progress in any state or in our country is a thoughtful examination and discussion of the ideas that will move our country forward. We're much too... We spend much, much too, time, too much time right now, in my opinion, on personality and much too little time on um, where people are on the issues and whether where they are on the issues makes sense and will move us forward and is consistent with the values that we have as a country. The work that's done by the Washington Policy Center is an example for the rest of the country about how to do a thoughtful, careful, meticulous job of advocating for issues that make sense so when groups like this ask me to come and speak, no matter how far away it is from New Jersey, I am happy to come. So thank you for inviting me, and thank you for the work you do. The second reason that I said yes was because they told me when they invited me that General Jim Mattis had already said yes. And I said, well, hell, man, if this is good enough for Mattis, it's definitely good enough for me. A, a true, true leader. A true leader. And for those of us who have had the opportunity to lead under difficult circumstances, and we'll see others who have done the same under very difficult circumstances, um, those are people that you want to spend as much time with as you possibly can, because when you do, it always makes you better.
And I got a chance to spend some time with General Mattis tonight after we got done smiling for lots of pictures together. And, it, and that conversation alone has made me a better leader um, just in the 20 minutes that we spent together. So thanks for spending that time with me tonight, General. I appreciate it very much. All right, so how did someone like me get elected not once but twice as the governor of one of the bluest states in America? Now, I know that you all here in Washington believe that you may, in fact, have the award as the bluest state in America. <laughs> and so I, I get that, but there's certainly a lot of indicators that point in your direction. But let me tell you from my perspective... New Jersey has not elected a Republican to the United States Senate since 1972. It is the longest streak of any state in America. Democrats outnumber Republicans in registered voters by 985,000 in New Jersey. And so we're pretty blue. How did we win? Well, first time that we ran, we won because the other guy was just so god-awful. <laughs> There's really no other way to put it. John Corzine, God love him, one of the worst politicians I've ever seen in my life. Former CEO of Goldman Sachs, outspent me three to one, and I still won. Some people would conclude that that means I'm great. I'm going to tell you the truth. He's just that bad. <laughs> And, and, and that's how I won. I was just the reasonable guy on the ballot who, when they said, we can't vote for him, who's left? And there I was, right there. The name was kind of snappy, and they went, oh, all right, let's give the kid a chance. It's important to understand that because leadership comes to you in many different ways. It isn't always this dramatic, Lincoln-esque passing of the mantle because of your moral character. That all matters once you get in. But getting there sometimes is not nearly as operatic as we may want to make it seem after it's over. And when I got into the governorship of New Jersey, unemployment was at 10.5%, and we had a $2 billion deficit for the five months remaining in the fiscal year on a $29 billion budget. And so the first thing I had to confront was closing that gap. And, so the, the, and I had a Democratic legislature. So they came in and I had promised to not raise taxes when I was running for governor because I thought New Jersey's already too expensive. And so they thought they had me right where they wanted me. They lied, of course, about the depth of the problem during the campaign said it was a three or four hundred million dollar deficit, which my first week in, my state treasurer came down the hall and said, remember that four hundred million dollar problem we had? And I said, yeah, he goes, it's two billion. And so we sat down and went line by line through the budget over three weeks to find how we were going to close this gap without raising taxes. And the Democrats continued to say, he's going to have to raise taxes. We'll give him a tax bill. He'll raise taxes. And so what I did was there's a little known statute in New Jersey called the Disaster Control Act. And what it does is gives the governor enormous authority over the budget and other matters if he declares a disaster. Now, the people who wrote that were talking about something like Sandy. But they didn't say natural disaster. <laughs> and I said to my lawyers, this looks like a disaster to me, man. Like, I don't know how you define it, but it looks a disaster to me. And what that would permit me to do is to cut $2 billion in spending by executive order without the permission of the legislature. So I didn't tell them I was going to do it. I asked the Senate president and the speaker for an opportunity to address the budget crisis before the legislature. They, they said, sure, because they thought I was coming down there to propose a tax increase to close the gap. So... Apparently, the custom before I became governor was that the governor would give the Senate president and the speaker a copy of his speech before he gave it, and then they would leak it. 
and take all the thunder away from the governor. So they, his staff, the staff of the two people, the speaker and the Senate president, about an, two hours before the speech, called down to say, where are our copies of the speech? And I, and, and I told my staff, no, don't give, them, don't give it to them. So the Senate president himself came down to my office and said, I want a copy of the speech. Now, this is a guy who will be a recurring figure in our talk tonight. His name is Stephen Sweeney, the president of the New Jersey State Senate, and he is also in his day job the president of the Iron Workers Union in New Jersey. So another shy and retiring character from New Jersey. He said, he pounded on the conference, he said, Governor, I will not be treated this way. I want to see the speech before you give it. And I looked at him and I said, Steve, this ain't Vegas, and I ain't Wayne Newton. It's one show a night, baby. That's it. And he just, to Steve's credit, he just burst out laughing. He said, okay, all right, I'll see you when you get down there. And he walked out. So I'll summarize what was a 35-minute speech in 30 seconds. I said to them, you created this huge problem. You lied to the people of New Jersey about it. You lied to me about it. Then you dumped it in my lap and forced me to, to try to raise taxes. Here is a list of the $2 billion in cuts that I have just instituted by executive order. You can thank me later. Have a nice day. And I walked out. <laughs> that was it. Well, the aftermath of that speech on the floor of the state legislature, uh, the Senate president said awful stuff. You know, this is this, this is a, not a dictatorship. This is a democracy. He compared me to, like, Genghis Khan and Napoleon, uh, Julius Caesar, all those great leaders of the past that I admire so much. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I read that in the paper that morning, and as coincidence would have it, we pulled up together to the State House the next day. I got out of my SUV here, got out of his, and we're walking in the back door of the State House. I said, hey, Steve, I read that stuff that you said about me in the paper this morning. And he said, uh-huh. And I said, and you know what? You've convinced me. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to revoke the executive order, and I'm going to make you find the $2 billion to cut rather than me. And this will tell you everything you need to know about politics in New Jersey. He put his arm around me and he said, hey, hey, Governor, don't overreact. <laughs> his... It's just stuff I said to the paper. Oh, you know, I, I got to say that stuff, but I'm glad you took the heat on this one, not me. We did it, and then for the budget that we were going to propose for the next year, the deficit was a projected $11 billion. And then they thought for sure I was going to raise taxes. And I gave my speech on the budget, which did not raise taxes and severely, significantly cut spending. And they said, if you don't send us a, a, approve a tax increase, we're going to shut down the government. And so I had a press conference and I said, I understand the Speaker and the Senate President have said they're going to shut down government. And if they do, you need to understand, one of the things that made John Corzine a bad politician is they shut, he had a Democratic legislature, they shut down the government on him his first year because he didn't increase taxes enough. And they were fighting over how much to increase taxes. And he said at that time, when they closed down government, he goes, I will not leave the state house until the government is reopened. I have set up a cot in my office and I will sleep in my office until the government's reopened. So this is the backdrop that I come into, right? And by the way, he talks exactly like that. And <laughs> you go on YouTube later, you're gonna laugh even harder. So. I knew this was what they expected. So I had a press conference where I said, listen, I am not. I mean, look at me. You think I'm sleeping on a cot in the state house? I said this on live television. I said, there's no chance, okay? There's no chance I wouldn't do that to me and I wouldn't do it to the cot. So... I said, here's what we're going to do. You want to shut down the government? That's fine. I'm going to get in these black SUVs over here. I'm going to go with the troopers. I'm going to go back to the governor's match. I'm going to go upstairs. I'm going to order a pizza. I'm going to open a beer, and I'm going to watch the Mets. <laughs> so I'm willing to sacrifice also. 
And when you reopen the government, call me, and I'll come back and run it again. But until that time, I'm not coming back. Hell, I'm not sleeping in some cot in the state house. Come on. Well, what eventually happened was they approved that budget. Democrats. Democrats approved that budget. Now, I don't say that for partisan reasons. I say that to let you know that strength of purpose doesn't create conflict if you do it in the right spirit. It forces compromise. Strength of character forces compromise if you approach it with a willing spirit. And that will be the theme of everything that I did in New Jersey over the eight years. Because that Democratic legislature was there for all eight of my years. And whether it was pension reform that saved $120 billion over the next 30 years by just saying that instead of 5% of salary, that public employees had to contribute 7% of salary, and that they no longer get an automatic cost of living adjustment on their pension. Those two reforms saved $120 billion for our state in 30 years, and a Democratic legislature approved it. Instead of giving every public employee in New Jersey free health care, free health insurance, they paid nothing when I became governor towards the premiums. We proposed and instituted that they pay on a sliding scale anywhere from 10% to 35% of their premium based upon how much they make. A fair, progressive way of charging people and letting them have skin in the game. That saved billions of dollars for our state, and a Democratic legislature approved it. We put a 2% cap on property taxes. 2% increase a year. Does that seem significant to you? I'll tell you why it was significant to us. In the 10 years before I was elected governor, property taxes in New Jersey went up 70% in 10 years. We imposed a hard 2% cap and then went back and said, you cannot have a 2% cap on taxes, but not have a 2% cap on the interest arbitration awards that are granted to public employees for their salary and benefits. I called the state legislature back into session against their will in July of 2010 to pass the property tax cap bill and then by the end of that year passed the interest arbitration cap bill and in my eight years as governor property taxes went up 15 percent instead of 70 percent over the other time. Who you elect and their willingness to compromise makes a difference. Ideas. And the strength of those ideas do make a difference and can be sold to the people of this country and of this state if you do it in a way that is persistent and persuasive. And that's what we did in those issues in New Jersey, and that's why we won. Someone mentioned my, my relationship with the teachers union. <laughs> this, guy's, this guy's watched like 10 YouTube videos, guaranteed. <laughs> He's the first, right? All the stuff, right? So, listen, the teachers' union, at least in New Jersey, is the biggest, most powerful political force in the state. They collect $140 million in dues a year. And they don't pay a nickel towards teacher salary, teacher pension, or teacher health care. That $140 million is merely to make friends and intimidate their adversaries. When I came into office, the favorability rating of the Teachers Union New Jersey was 71%. People said to me, you cannot take them on. It's a losing proposition. We wound up doing 40 town halls in our first year on the issue of fairness. And here's what I did. I'd go into town hall meetings and say, and I'll say it to a group like this. And this is the part where you have to be responsive now. Okay? <laughs> Writing the check was not the only thing you did tonight. Now you got to participate. This is the audience participation portion of our program. Later, General Mattis will have you doing calisthenics. Um, <laughs> I obviously will not. Um, how many people in this audience 
after three years on your job, were guaranteed that job for the rest of your life, raise your hand. One, two, out of 1,203, out of 1,250. Okay, four, five. We're, it's a landslide. I'd say to people, how many people in this audience, after 20 years of service in their job, were guaranteed 70% of their salary for the rest of their lives? How many of you in this audience were guaranteed to have free health insurance for you and your family from the day you entered your job until the day you die? Okay? We got like three there. We got a similar type of response in every town hall in New Jersey. And I said, that's exactly right. Because that's what the teachers union has negotiated for their members. That's what your elected representatives have given away on your behalf. You're paying for it. And it is no longer affordable. This is not a criticism of teachers. Teachers deserve a union as good as they are. As socially conscious and responsible as they are. And they didn't have one. And so we took that issue on head on to say to people, if you believe New Jersey is unaffordable, if you're complaining to me about your property taxes and your income taxes, I'm with you. But there are no easy answers. And you've got to make some people who have taken too much give some back. This in the middle of a budget crisis was a persuasive argument when you added to it that I went to the teachers union and said, would you for just one year just one year, pay 1.5% of your premiums for your health insurance to get us through this budget crisis. And the response from the teachers union in a press statement was, the governor has lost his mind. <laughs> so I went out and said, okay, we have our school budgets are voted on in the spring in New Jersey. So I went out and said, I'm voting against my school budget and I want every person in New Jersey to vote against their school budget also to send a signal to the teachers union that we're not going to take it anymore. I came back and this, I have a very smart chief of staff, Princeton graduate, um, corporate, former corporate executive, calm, serene guy. It's the only time in the entire time he served me that I walked into my office after an event and he was waiting in my office for me. And he looked at me and he said, um, so, we're voting against the school budgets. And I said, yeah, yeah. He said, might have been something we wanted to talk about. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 it'll be fine. He said, do you know that 76% of the school budgets pass every year on average over the last 10 years? And the school elections are in two weeks. And I said, well, we got some work to do. <laughs> we went out and held town hall meetings every day for the next 14 days. And on election night, 63% of the budgets in New Jersey failed. Failed. And by the time the end of the first year, the teachers union favorable rating had gone from 71% to 43%. Now, I'm not, I don't want any applause for their favorability rating going down. Their conduct earned them their favorability rating going down. I just pointed it out. And the fact is that that helped to level the playing field. It didn't give me an advantage. It just leveled the playing field. They had $140 million. And let me tell you how they spent it. You heard Chris Christie is an enemy of public education. Chris Christie launched the biggest attack on publication in, in New Jersey history. We, in fact, were driving down the Garden State Parkway one day, heading down to the beach. And there was a big billboard in the Garden State Parkway. And my children were in the car. And it was a picture of me. And it said, Chris Christie hates children. <laughs> so my 11-year-old son, Patrick, looked at me and said, Hey, did you see that billboard, Dad? And I said, Yeah. And he goes, Your people should get better pictures of you. <laughs> I said, Hey, Pat, those are not my people. It got so bad that the head of the Bergen County, our, our, our largest county in the state, most populous counties, teachers union, sent out an email to his membership, which unfortunately for him, one of them disagreed with and leaked, where he urged members to pray for my death. 
And when this came out, the president of the statewide teachers union knew that she finally had a real problem on her hands. So she asked to come over to speak to me. So I said, sure. So she came over and she was in there with my chief of staff and I, you know, the congenial quiet one. And we sat there and she said to me, Governor, I want to apologize. That was a, an awful thing to have been done. And we, you know, we just, we don't countenance that kind of stuff. And I said, thank you. I said, I appreciate that. I said, you're, you're firing him, right? And she said, oh, no, 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 we're not going to fire him. And I said, well, I mean, you can't allow somebody who's praying for the death of the duly elected governor to stay employed. I mean, they got to be fired. And she said, no, no, we're not firing him. And I said, well, if this guy over here, my chief of staff, had sent out an email praying for your death, there'd be 10,000 teachers on the front steps of the state house demanding his firing. And you know what? They'd be late because I would have already fired him. I said, you're not firing him. And she said, no. And I said, then your apology is not accepted. And I stood up from my desk. She said, well, we have some issues to discuss. And I said, well, I don't know who you're discussing them with. I said, because the guy back here is supposed to be dead. <laughs> and she said to me, are you kicking me out of this office? And I said, yes, I am. And she said, I've never been treated like this in my life. And I said, well, there's a first time for everything. So she turns around to walk out, and my chief of staff is completely flummoxed now. This meeting has not gone as he thought it might. He was told that this was going to be an apology, mea culpa, kumbaya meeting. Now I'm kicking her out, and she's storming out, and he doesn't know what to say. And he says, thanks oh so much for coming by. <laughs> the door closes, and I look at him, and I say, thanks oh so much for coming by. And he goes, that's what I had prepared to say. And I'm like, things went a little off the rails, Rich. What can I tell you? The point of all this is, remember something. Politics and public life is still at its core a human endeavor. With frail human beings on both sides of things. And sometimes you're going to have good days, some days you're not. Some days you're going to be on your game and really delivering as a leader, and other days you're going to fall back a little bit. That's why the ideas are so important. The ideas are constant. The ideas are the muscle that holds this democracy together. And then when people of goodwill and good character ascend to leadership, then that becomes a body politic that's the envy of the world. And that's why we have to always remember that the fight against the teachers union was entertaining. And I had a lot of fun with it, believe me. I really did. You know, they said that it was, it was hurting students that I wasn't giving free health care anymore. I said, let me ask you a question. Has any of your kids come home and said, Mom, Dad, I swear I would get an A in physics if you would just give Mrs. Robinson free health care? <laughs> I swear to you I would. Has any of your kids said that? Of course they have, but they don't care. Come on, I don't care about this. This is ridiculous. Then they started sending flyers home in kids' backpacks against me. Yeah. So I said, listen, we have to stop this. I'm not going to allow the unions in this state to treat our children like they're drug mules. <laughs> that got a little attention, General. <laughs> that got a little national coverage. And... And they were very offended by that. But what the hell else would you call it? I mean, you're, you're, you're putting something in the backpack of a child, the import of which they cannot and do not understand. And you're asking them to transport it to someone who will understand it and will know the import and the dangerousness of that. That's what drug mules do. We need to call these things what they are. At the end of the day... It's not about being negative or nasty or angry. It's about being direct. But to have that honesty, that bluntness, be geared towards ultimately reaching agreement, not just argument for the sake of argument. Argument for the sake of argument is where we are in this country right now. And for eight years in New Jersey, I will tell you now that a majority of the Democratic Senate caucus in my state, they now have a very liberal Democratic governor who replaced me, I'm telling you that two-thirds of them would vote to have me back right now because they can't make deals with him, but they made deals with me. 
They agree with him more, but they can't come to agreement with each other because they're unwilling to compromise with each other. This government was founded on the principle of friction creating heat and that heat creating compromise. And that's what we have to remember. We've forgotten the last part. And so the success we had in New Jersey over eight years was because of that. And did we have fun while we were doing it? You bet we did. They didn't pay me enough not to have fun. You have to enjoy this too and not take yourself too seriously. And understand that you need to be a real person that people can relate to. Be yourself. I got the greatest advice from my mom, who's now gone for 15 years and never lived to see me become governor. But the advice she gave me as a young person applied every day to my governorship. She used to say to me, Christopher... And she was the only one who called me Christopher. Because if you had named your kid Chris Christie, you would use Christopher, right? I mean, you know. <laughs> she, she takes the blame for that. But she said to me, Christopher, be yourself. Because then tomorrow, you don't have to try to remember who you pretended to be yesterday. <laughs> Which brings us briefly to the subject of the 2020 presidential election. In some respects, I wish some of these people would pretend to be somebody else, to tell you the truth. Um, anybody who tells you right now that they have any idea what's going to happen in a year and two weeks um, is lying to you. And I want you to remember that at this time, four years ago, Donald Trump was in a very tough race with Jeb Bush. And then in December was in a very tough race with me. And then in January was in a tough race with Ted Cruz. And then in February was in a tough race with Marco Rubio. And then in March was in a tough race with John Kasich. It changed monthly. You don't know what's going to happen right now. But here's a few things I'll observe. You want to talk about personality overtaking ideas. That's a very dangerous place for us to be right now, in my opinion, everybody. Because some of the ideas that are being talked about on both sides in this race have enormous consequence for this country's future. And we better listen to them. I'll give you one example on each side. The president two weeks ago pulled out of Syria. Now, whether you agree or disagree with that, I disagree. But whether you agree or disagree, I want you to remember something. He promised that during the campaign. He said he was going to do it. Some people thought he didn't really mean it. Some people thought he didn't really understand it. Some people thought he'd never really do it. He did it. What people say in campaigns matters. And people are dying in Syria right now, in part because of that decision. So those things have consequences. You know, a few weeks ago at the last Democratic debate, or maybe it was a couple of months ago when they did this, they asked people, who wants to decriminalize crossing the border? And they all raised their hands. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, these are the same people who want to impeach and remove a president based on a phone call but want to say, if you come across the border of our country without permission, it's no longer a crime. But the phone call is a crime. Listen to what people say, because there's a chance, I know you're skeptical about this, but there's a chance they might mean it. And if they get in, they may act on it. Barack Obama had one of the greatest sayings ever about this. He said, elections have consequences. Elections have consequences. So for 2020 right now, don't try to play, you know, pollster. Don't try to play pundit. I mean, how I'm a pundit every Sunday on ABC. And here's the greatest part of that job, by the way. It's like being a weatherman. <laughs> really is. You go on, you say what you think's going to happen. It doesn't happen. And they have you back next week. <laughs> and they pay you for it. It's the greatest job you've ever seen in your life. So don't waste your time. Don't waste your time doing that. Listen to these people. Listen to the president. 
Listen to him and listen to the men and women who are standing on that stage in the Democratic debate. Listen to what they're saying. Get away from who looks better, who acted better, who stumbled over their words, who looked older, who looked younger. I mean, all that garbage. Listen to what they're saying. That's our responsibility now. So anything I could tell you about the 2020 election now will be wrong maybe within 48 hours could be, definitely will be wrong within 48 days. So I'm not going to waste your time on that. I want you to understand that Syria happened because the president said he'd do it. It took him three years, but he did it. And if they say on the other side, they want Medicare for all, and they're willing to wipe out the entire private medical insurance business in this country, whether you agree with that or not, they may mean it. And you need to figure out whether you're okay with that or not. Listen, I'll end with this. Um, my favorite founder is not Washington, and it's not Jefferson, it's not Franklin, and despite the really cool musical, it's not Hamilton. <laughs> my favorite founder is John Adams. And... Thank you for the applause. Some people say that I like Adams the most because he was overweight and ornery. <laughs> I like that, but I, right? But, but that's not the only reason. John Adams was the heartbeat of the revolution. He was the heartbeat of the revolution. When everyone else wanted to defer to the king, Adams stood and fought. Adams was the voice the heartbeat of liberty, of freedom in this country. Adams was willing to be unpopular for the ideas that he believed in, and he fought for them long enough that they eventually became popular and the policy of this country, in fact, the foundation of this country. Now, when Adams was near death, 50 years after the Declaration of Independence, and you all remember that the two biggest antagonists of the revolution, Adams and Jefferson, were the founders who lived the longest, and they died on the same day, the 4th of July, 1826, 50 years after they signed. A couple of months before his death, Adams was writing for his diary. Abigail Adams had already died, and I will tell you, if you're looking for something to understand, what real sacrifice means, read the book with the letters of Abigail and John Adams to each other during all those times. And you'll know for sure that she was as much a founding father as any of the rest of them. Any of the rest of them. Adams wrote this in his diary. He wrote it for posterity because he was worried about the future of this country he had helped to found. And this is what he wrote. He wrote it for posterity. He wrote it for us. He said, you shall never know the sacrifices that were made to secure for you your liberty. I pray you make a good use of it. For if you do not, I shall repent in heaven for ever having made the sacrifice at all. If if you want to think about the 2020 election, I want to suggest to you respectfully that you think about it in the context of those words from John Adams. You shall never know the sacrifices that were made to secure for you your liberty. I pray you make a good use of it. If Adams was watching us now, and I'm confident he is, is he preparing to celebrate or to repent? And when we do whatever we're going to do in 2020, not just who we vote for, but how we participate in that process as Americans, think about John Adams and whether given the sacrifices he made and his wife made to establish this extraordinary country, whether they are celebrating or repenting in heaven for how we're conducting ourselves as the freest, wealthiest, 
most powerful, most prosperous people the earth has ever seen. This is still the greatest country the world has ever known. And it is now us who are going to be judged on what our stewardship looked like. Not only by Adams from heaven, but from our children and grandchildren here on earth. I don't want to be judged as someone who sat on the sidelines and was unwilling to take risk and to try to make things happen to make our country greater. And I think if you're here tonight that you feel exactly the same way. So thanks for having me. It's great to see you. Thank you very much, Governor Christie. And reminder that uh, Governor Christie's book, Let Me Finish, and he's got plenty more to say, believe me, <laughs> will be available at the Barnes & Noble table just outside the main ballroom doors after dinner, and he is staying to sign copies. I want to turn the podium over now to Washington Policy Center President Dan Mead Smith. All right, thank you, Teresa. Not looking forward to following Governor Christie. That was fantastic. Thank you for being with us. You're an inspiration to a state like ours that wants to elect a governor like you. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Dan Mead Smith, the president of the Policy Center. Tonight is a great night for our organization. While we have much to celebrate, which we will do in a few minutes, you'll hear from our research team, our work, as you know, is far from done. We need to accomplish even more and move our state in a new direction. As part of our three-year strategic planning process this year, we focused on our mission statement, improving lives through market solutions. And we talked about how people, especially younger generations, are questioning capitalism, free enterprise, free markets, and are now seeing are not seeing the very power of the system that has given them the choices that they now take for granted, whether it's their smartphone or medicines that treat and cure ailments and diseases, or whether it's school choice that offers opportunities for low-income students. All around us, there is evidence of the benefits of individual choice and free markets. Yet here in our state and across the country, as you've seen, some leaders are embracing the ideas of socialism and more and more government. And young people, unaware from historical context, are increasingly convinced socialism offers the equality and fairness that they value. This is not the time to be turning our country away from free market principles. At Washington Policy Center, we're committed to the free market. That's why this evening, as part of our new strategic plan, we're excited to make a major announcement. Please turn your attention to the screens. Of the millennials in the survey, the majority said they would prefer to be in either a socialist, communist, or even a fascist country. Studies show a majority of professors are liberal. Are they brainwashing college students? 44% would prefer to live under a socialist system. So if they want good jobs, if they want good schools, if they want access to a decent living standard, they should join our movement. A rigged economy that 57% of all new income is going to the top 1%. Right now, tons of young people, millennials, who do not accept the system as a just system. It's trendy now to support socialism because the messaging battle has been won by the left because it's viewed as tolerant, open-minded, and compassionate. Our Young Professionals program sponsored college club debates this year. And in our post-debate surveys, we found that 82% of the students said that they had never heard this perspective on campus before. Never. Washington Policy Center was founded on the values of free markets. 
improving lives never goes out of style. Since 1970, free market reforms around the world have led to a decline in extreme poverty by 80%. 80% in just the last few decades. So when I hear young people are choosing socialism and they haven't been told about free market successes, are they really choosing socialism or is it being chosen for them? We know free markets work, we know they create opportunity, and we know they lift people up. Socialism is about government mandates. It restricts choice, it restricts opportunity. Free markets create, and we're gonna make sure the next generation knows that. So we're announcing the launch of a new bold statewide marketing campaign that will aim to change the culture of our state especially amongst the younger generation, where it's needed most. Free markets create will blanket the airwaves, the internet, state newspapers, starting in January with one goal in mind, change the mindset and the current uncritical fascination with more and more government, and even socialism by illustrating what free markets have and will create. Whatever it takes to change the perception that socialism is somehow a good thing, it's a multi-prong attack on an ideology that reduces choice and opportunity by focusing on a positive message of what free markets create. It's an effort that's desperately needed, and we need your help to make it happen. We'll be launching this campaign and teasing it over the next several weeks and launching it to be part of the debate in 2020. So it's right around the corner. Stay tuned. We need your help to make this a reality and it's gonna be the biggest thing we've ever done. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to introduce our Eastern Washington Advisory Board and Pillar Society member, Executive Vice President and CFO of Red Lion Hotels and the founding partner of Northwest CFO, Julie Shiflett. Welcome everyone tonight. Um, really excited about all, everybody who is here. Thank you to everyone who sponsored a table. And, you know, just think about it. 1,200 people in Bellevue a couple of weeks ago, 1,200 people here in Spokane. Who knew they could find that many fair-minded, liberal, non-thinking people in Seattle, right? But here we are. And looking for what they did over there for us to be able to do here. So let's talk about that. There's not another organization like the Washington Policy Center that accomplishes so much. You heard Dan talk about the Free Markets Create program, about creating education for our citizens, about keeping free markets, and about keeping free choice. And it, so how many of you are excited about this new campaign that Dan just announced? So my additional question here tonight is asking you to help us launch this campaign, as well as everything else that the Washington Policy Center does. So guess what that crowd in Bellevue did just a few weeks ago? They took the amount that they donated last year, and they increased it by $60,000. So what I'm saying is that if each of us here in this room looked at what we donated last year and we increased it by just $100, we could beat them. We could, have, we could create more here. And let's face it, it's Apple Cup, right? We're talking the Apple Cup piece, right? So, so let's get the west side and the east side and let's see what the east side can do. So I want to talk about what inspires me for the Washington Policy Center and asking about what inspires you. So the Washington Policy Center, it's an independent nonprofit organization, which is completely funded by individuals like you and like me. We have an annual budget of $4 million, and for that, we impact public policy and improve the lives across the state. So while you're reaching to that tent in front of you, which, by the way, underneath it has, a little, has an ink pen and an envelope. 
I'd like you to just close your eyes and take a moment and think about what brought you here tonight. What really resonates with you and what does that mean to you? So is it that Washington Policy Center supports agriculture? and keeping agriculture op markets open here in Washington State, the $8 billion worth of products that Washington State creates and exports, we feed the world. And Washington Policy does things such as helping debunk myths about our dams, keeping water free for our farmers. In addition, <laughs> Northwest Farm Credit's clapping in the back. In addition, what about the charter schools that we have? We would not have charter schools if it wasn't for the Washington Policy Center here in Washington State. The first charter school graduating class in Washington State, 97% of those children are going to college. 23% of the students that are in our charter schools qualify for reduced or free lunch. Our charter schools focus on special education. And think about it. What if you were a young woman who found herself to be a mother while she was in high school? And all of a sudden, there's a charter school in Spokane, Washington, that's going to help provide for you daycare, a high school education, special parenting classes, and the ability to complete your high school degree. So while you're looking at that card and thinking about what's that worth to you, think about some of the things that we do. And the free, supporting the free market policies of Washington State. So think about what motivates and inspires you. Because those things are the issues that Washington Policy Center supports as well as more. So if you're inspired by what you heard, I encourage you right now, because now's the time, reach out, get those, those cards and those envelopes. And there's pictures of them on the, on the screens if you're not sure what it looks like. Oh, wait, Dan has one for me. Dan says, Dan says this is what you fill out, and this is where you deposit it. So um, what, what we're looking for here is what I would like to encourage you to do is fill this out and then think about this is a 100% tax-deductible donation. So while you're filling that out, increase it by the amount of income tax you would have paid in Washington State had the Policy Center not been supporting our right to have no income tax. So here's where we're going. We have 1,200 people. If you, uh, what I'd love you to do right now is t make out your donation, increase your donation by $100 over what you did last year or what you would do right now. And if you're a couple, that means it's a $200 increase. <laughs> so fill out your card, place it in the red envelope, look at your neighbor, encourage them to fill out their card, and then let's just really focus on everything we appreciate about the Washington Policy Center and the staff. And at the end of the day, we are an organization that our mission is to provide accurate information for the public, for policymakers, for voters, and for the media. So please donate tonight and go Cougs. So now I'd like to bring up John Otter. Should I pause and give you a little time to uh, get those pens out? Julie, that was awesome. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm John Otter. I'm the proud chairman of this organization. Our organization is growing by leaps and bounds. And you may not realize it, but this December, we celebrate our 10th year of our full-time office in Eastern Washington here in Spokane. As for those who support the free market, support limited government, support freedom, I know that it's, it, it's easy to get discouraged in this state with a policy and a political climate like ours. 
But just take a moment and think what we've been able to accomplish over the last decade. Julie mentioned some of them. Charter schools are open. We don't have an income tax. We don't have a carbon tax. And remote testimony has now been secured in the State Senate. Tonight we celebrate the many great achievements of, uh, of, Wa uh, of Washington Policy Center. Those achievements would not be possible without your support. And tonight we want to take a few brief moments to let our research team honor you with what they've been able to do just over the last 12 months. So I'd like you to direct your attention to stage right, table 53, and our environmental director, Todd Myers. Good evening. So I'm Todd Myers, I'm the environmental director, and thanks to your support, the Washington Policy Center created an online calculator to help families understand how much last year's big government carbon tax initiative would have cost them if it passed. That calculator received widespread media attention, including KXLY here in Spokane, and armed with that information, families went to the polls and overwhelmingly rejected the carbon tax initiative. <clears throat> and based on that experience, I was invited to testify in Ottawa, albeit in January, before the Canadian Parliament, which means that your impact and your support is not only having an impact in Washington State, but across North America, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Todd. Uh, my name is Pam Lewison, and I am the director of WPC's Agriculture Project. Thanks to your support, we protected the federal H-2A jobs program against attacks by state officials who are trying to put up barriers to legal immigrants finding work opportunities and blocking Washington farmers and ranchers from hiring reliable labor that's needed to maintain our food supply. Now, please direct your attention to table 72 and to my colleagues, Jason Mercier and Marie Maria Frost. Well, thank you, Pam. I'm Jason Mercier, Government Reform Director for the Washington Policy Center. And thanks to your support, together we fought efforts to impose a statewide income tax, <laughs> defeating yet again proposals for a capital gains, and we can all say together, income tax, and we are now working to stop Seattle's efforts to use the courts to open the doors to an income tax across the state. We are also very excited to see Spokane voters considering two of our recommendations this election cycle. Proposition 2 would ban a local income tax, and Proposition 1 would open the doors to the budget process providing transparency on collective bargaining agreements. If voters approve these, it will send a strong message to our lawmakers in Olympia. My name is Maria Frost, and I'm the director of WPC's Coal Center for Transportation. Thanks to your support, we expose the fact that ridership on Ben Franklin Transit, the Tri-Cities Transit Agency, has declined by 40% despite population growth. Yet even as the agency serves fewer people, it continues to spend significantly more on operations and collect record sales tax money from the Tri-Cities community. In response, Ben Franklin officials admitted to us that they would not pursue certain cost-saving measures because they just value their relationship with the labor union over taxpayers. Now at table 25 are my colleagues David Bose, Roger Stark, and Lee Finna. Thanks, Maria. My name is uh, David Bose. I'm the Communications Director for Washington Policy Center, speaking on behalf of Aaron Shannon with our Center for Workers' Rights, who is unable to be here today. It's because of you that public employees in this state are learning of their First Amendment right to opt out uh, and use their Janus rights to opt out of union membership, and they're doing so by the thousands. It's, it's because of you that they're hearing about it across the state on radio programs, including right here in Spokane. In fact, all summer long they saw a billboard in Spokane on Monroe Street, and that was all because of you. Thousands are exercising that right because of your support.
Thank you, Dave. My name is Lee Finna. I'm the director of the Center for Education at the Washington Policy Center. Opponents of charter schools are still active, but thanks to your support, next year five more charter schools will open in Washington State. <laughs> By then, over 4,500 children will attend a public charter school in our state. And I'm going to ad lib here. This is a great step forward in education in Washington state. Building on this success, we are working every day to expand learning choices for families. Thank you, Leif. My name is Roger Stark, and I am the healthcare policy analyst at Washington Policy Center. And thanks to your support, together we have been able to participate in the ongoing debate for the direction of our healthcare system, both in Washington State as well as nationally. <clears throat> thanks to your support, we have been able to advocate for free market ideas in our healthcare debate in regional publications such as the Puget Sound Business Journal and the Seattle Times. We have also been able to participate nationally with such publications as the American Specter, uh, The Federalist, Forbes, and The Washington Examiner. And now I would ask you to turn your attention back to the main stage uh, to hear from our Vice President for Research, Paul Guppy. Thanks, Roger. Uh, as the director of our research program, I have the distinct privilege of overseeing some of the sharpest minds in the state who really like to dig into the issues and report those out to policymakers and our members across the state. As you can see, our research staff is excited and proud of the support that we receive from all of our members. Thanks to you, we are able to focus every day on producing high-quality studies and commentary on key issues, and we do it with enthusiasm, accuracy, and intellectual integrity. We see the impact of our work in, a wide, in the wide range of coverage that we receive in the news media, on social media, and to the good response we get in Olympia and in communities across the state. We often have to deal with attacks uh, from the left. Uh, we are often involved in controversial issues. We're fine with that. We are always up for lively debate. Our staff enjoys doing that. But we notice that our accuracy is almost never questioned. So with that, I would like to offer a toast. Please join me in raising a glass to everything that we have accomplished together in the state, and here is to more victories in the future. Thank you. Hear, hear. And back to you, Teresa. Thank you, Paul. Those incredible accomplishments and WPC's work would not be possible without some of WPC's top sponsors, and we'd like to recognize some of them now. Our champion level sponsors include Kent Clausen, Bill and Meredith Ferris, Quinn, and Wells Fargo. And our gold sponsors this evening, Ann and Stacy Coles. Empire Bolt, Ron and Heidi Stanley, Washington Trust Bank, Wafla, Bill and Judy Williams, Wayne and Tarina Williams, and our patron sponsors, including Absher Construction, the Association of Washington Business, Dwayne and Andre Alton, Bernston Porter, Bill and Millie Baldwin, the Building Industry Association of Washington, Dennis and Norma Jean Hansen, Harms Pacific Transport, Enlin Empire Distribution Systems, Reese Concrete Products, Allen Roy, Santa Fe, Sharpshooting Indoor Range and Gun Shop, Julie Shiflett, the Spokane Home Builders Association, the Spokane Journal of Business, and Martin and Diane Stever. We also have dozens and dozens of table sponsors tonight, too many to mention, but we want to thank all of our sponsors here this evening. Thank you.
And we'll also be recognizing all of our Pillar Society sponsors coming up in just a few minutes. We want to recognize all of the elected officials that were able to join us this evening, including Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers. Congressman Dan Newhouse. Of course, we heard just a little while ago from Washington Secretary of State Kim Wyman. Also here tonight, State House Minority Leader J.T. Wilcox. Spokane Mayor David Condon, who gave our opening prayer. And Spokane County Treasurer Michael Baumgartner, who was one of our Champion of Freedom Award recipients last year. And all of the other elected officials, if you would please rise and be recognized. Thank you very much for your service, and we'll now take a short break for dinner. All right, everyone, it's time to restart the program. One of the great things about tonight's event, in addition to the food and the incredible speakers, is that we get to recognize some very special award recipients. To do that, please welcome back WPC President Dan Mead Smith. Thank you, Teresa. As part of our Young Professionals Program and our outreach to college students, which tonight features over 75 students are here tonight from five colleges all across Eastern Washington, Washington Policy Center honors the legacy of our dear friend, their late Congresswoman Jennifer Dunn, with a $15,000 overall scholarship program in her name. Our committee, made up of our board members, chooses the recipient based on some of the characteristics that Jennifer both valued and embodied. We look for a young woman who values service to others, civics, and who possesses the leadership qualities that Jennifer Dunn Thompson exemplified. Please join me in recognizing this year's recipient of the Jennifer Dunn Thompson Scholarship, Claire Anderson. Claire is a senior at Whitworth University here in Spokane, majoring in political science, and there are two tables worth of Whitworth students here this evening. Claire also spent time working for Congresswoman McMorris Rogers on both her campaign and her district office. So tonight I'd like to present the award to Claire Anderson for proudly reflecting the leadership and commitment to public service and personal values of Jennifer Dunn Thompson, for representing the bright promise of a rising generation, and for exemplifying the talent, hard work, and willingness to carry Jennifer's ideals into the future. Congratulations, Claire. I would just like to thank everybody at the Washington Policy Center. This award is such an honor. Um, I'm so excited to be able to get the opportunity to carry out Jennifer Dunn Thompson's legacy, not only on the Whitworth campus, but also after I graduate. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dan, and congratulations to Claire. It's now my pleasure to welcome the president of WPC's Pillar Society. He is also the past chairman of WPC's Board of Directors and the founder of Burnson Porter CPA Firm in Bellevue. He is also the chair for tonight's dinner and a cougar. Please welcome Greg Porter. Yeah. 
Thank you, Teresa. Okay, do we have any Cougar football fans in the audience? All right. Are we going to beat Oregon? Yeah. Okay, I played five years for the Cougars in the late 70s and early 80s. And Oregon and Oregon State, they were so terrible, we never even started our first string. But I, I do think we need to start our first string in this game. Uh, my dear Deborah, she sees, when I say I played five years for, for Washington State, she always says, hey, you know, they think she's, they're going to think it took you five years to, to graduate from college. You've got to explain the situation. Well, quickly, the situation, this is a tribute to Coach Jim Walden, who was my coach at the time. Uh, I, 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 got dra I got recruited out of the Bay Area, came up. And I was a, as a freshman, I was third string, and I during the season, my freshman year, I beat out a junior, and then I beat out the senior. So by the fifth game, my freshman year, I was a starter for the Cougars, and we had, I had, my family had no money, and I, I'm thinking, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm starting, I'm playing, I'm not gonna red shirt, so I've got to make sure that I, I go to class at a clip where in four years I graduate, because I'm not gonna be here five years, because I'm not gonna red shirt. And uh, after my first year, I, I started after the fifth game. My, my uh, sophomore year, I started. My junior year, I get hurt. Now I'm injured, and I do redshirt. And then I come back, and I play my fourth year. And I, I did go to school to clip to make sure I graduated in four years. And I, I did, in fact, graduate. And I go to Coach Walden. I go, I go Coach, I, I, I graduated. And he looks at me, he goes, from what? I, I, I go, <laughs> I, go I, I, I graduated from college. And he looked at me like nobody's ever done that on the football team before. And um, I, 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 he goes, well, you haven't played your last year of football for me. I go, yeah, I know, but coach, I, I graduated. I, I have an, a degree in accounting. I'm going to work for, a, at that time, there was a big eight uh, CPA firm, uh, Ernst & Winnie in Seattle. I have a job lined up. And he goes, no, 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 you haven't, you, you haven't played your last year of eligibility. He said, have you ever thought about going to graduate school? And I said, yeah, I thought about going to Stanford, which was close to where I lived. I always thought about, you know, someday maybe being able to get an MBA from Stanford. And he looks at me and he goes, he goes, I don't know if you know this or not, but it doesn't matter whether you're an undergraduate student or a graduate student, as long as you're a full-time student and haven't used your eligibility, you can play football. And I go, well, I would never heard that before in my entire life. And he goes, if you stay and play your last year for me, this is how gracious he was. And I wasn't that great, and uh, not like uh, Kirk Clausen down here, who played for the Jets for two years. I mean, I never made it. I never made it past college. And um, he goes, "If you stay and play your last year for me, I will pay your whole way through our MBA program." And I looked at him and I go, "Okay, okay." And um, <laughs> so, in five years, Deborah, I ended up with an undergraduate degree and a, a master's uh, in business administration, but. Okay, this isn't about me or Jim Walden, but I am happy to be back in Cougar Country. Uh, Pillar Society members, everybody who's in the Pillar Society, please stand up and be recognized. Okay, you guys are the lifeblood of this, this organization. You are the oxygen in the room. You're what fuels us. You're what enables us to do all that great work that we're doing with the Young Professionals Group, uh, including the college clubs at Gonzaga and Washington State University, uh, the right to work stuff we're doing, the charter school stuff we're doing, no state income tax, you name it. It's because of your dollars and that effort that's put forth are the reason, the reason that we've been as successful as we have. I've been, the, I was the, prior to being the Pillar Society president, I was a chairman for eight years. I'm also on the finance committee. I'm a CPA. I can tell you, we are excellent stewards of your money. This is the most efficient organization uh, around by far. And not only are they efficient, but they're effective. And that's how we want to measure ourselves. And you look at what we've accomplished. You've heard it here tonight. It's an absolute amazing organization. I could not be prouder. So how do you get, what is the, for those of you that aren't in the Pillar Society and maybe haven't heard of it before, what is the Pillar Society? It is our major gift group. It's a, a three-year commitment at a minimum of $5,000 per year. It steps up, it graduates from that, and uh, we actually have the largest Pillar Society uh, member in the room. He's sitting at uh, table, table 30. I, I won't mention his name, but he, uh, his, initials, his initials are Phil Scott. And... Um, 
he, and he gives in the six figures, six figures to the Pillar Society every year. And I mean, I'm talking about six figures to the left of the decimal point, six figures. So that's a big deal, and uh, we're very proud. We're very proud to have members at the $5,000 level or at Phil's level. And Leslie, his lovely wife, as well. Thank you. Uh, so we, at this point, we have about 100. And, uh, it, it could change any minute. It could change. 178 members in the Pillar Society. Uh, we have a renewal rate. When we, when Dan and I usually meet with uh, almost every Pillar Society renewal. And we have a renewal rate that's darn near close to 100%. When we go in there together, somebody likes either one of us. They, they don't necessarily like both of us, but they like either one of us. And, um, and we have a renewal rate, I mean, literally close to 100%. I mean, that is unheard of for a nonprofit. I mean, absolutely amazing. Uh, I would say at least approximately, we, we have statistics, but about 50% or so actually raise their commitment level to the Pillar Society uh, when we meet with them after their three-year uh, period has elapsed. We have uh, several people that come to us in the middle of their pledge. They're so excited about the organization that they want to increase it, you know, mid midstream, which seems extremely odd to us. But uh, we're we're happy to we're happy to do that too. Some of the uh, cool benefits of being associated with the Pillar Society, apart from just being a great Washingtonian and and uh, watching the money be used for the great purposes of the organization. We have a lot of cool events. We have a lot of Pillar Society dinners that are hosted at, uh, at board members' homes. Uh, we had uh, Daniel Krauthammer, the son of Charles Krauthammer, was one of the speakers here a few, um, few months ago. We had Kimberly Strassel at another board member's house. So we do that both on uh, the eastern and western side of the state. Uh, we have a lot of great Pillar Society events, including the event that we had at the Hagedon home over here. Uh, in Coeur d'Alene, where we had uh, Butch, Governor Butch Otter was speaking at that event. That was excellent. We did an event at uh, DeLille Cellars. We do an event, two events. We're going to do two events this year, uh, one in uh, Palm Springs that we've done for several years in a row. That's on March 14th, so mark your calendar. We're going to do another one uh, in the Phoenix area, area, area in Arizona as well. So that's going to be fun fun as well. And then, of course, you get recognized. You get recognized here, and you're never going to not be able to be at an annual dinner, whether it's Bellevue or whether it's here. You're assured a seat if you're a Pillar Society member. So I want to thank everybody for their, that is in the Pillar Society. I want those of you that are not to please consider joining the Pillar Society. There's a Pillar Society brochures on your table. Look at it. Fill it out. Um, you know, I would love to. I would love to be able to beat Seattle because this is really where I'm from. I'm not really from Seattle. I would love to be able to beat Seattle in terms of, you know, how many new Pillar Society members that we sign up tonight. So, so please take a look at it. It's a great organization. If you'd like to just talk to Dan or me about it uh, on the card that you had that you filled out for the contribution, you can check the box that you want to talk to us. So I implore you. Of all the things I'm involved in, and I'm involved in a lot, I am the most proud to be associated with the Washington Policy Center for the work that it does for all the citizens of the state of Washington. So thank you, and please consider joining. Go Cougs. I think you forgot that part. <laughs> thank you, Greg. Every year, Washington Policy Center selects one person of distinction who has devoted themselves to being a champion of freedom, someone whose contributions to the cause are beyond dispute. Past winners include Congresswoman Jennifer Dunn, former Congressman Doc Hastings, Spokane Public School Superintendent Dr. Shelley Redinger, and so many more. Here to present this year's Champion of Freedom Award is WPC board member and managing director of the Phil Scott Group at Merrill Lynch, Phil Scott. Good evening. I graduated from the Naval Academy exactly 30 years yeah, babe. Exactly 30 years after Admiral Hayward did. And while I was in the Navy, Admiral Hayward was our CNO. 
At this time, if somebody told me I would someday be on the same stage as the CNO, I never would have believed it. This is truly an honor for me to be here on this stage with one of the greatest admirals in the history of the U.S. Navy. In fact, did you know that there have only been 32 CNOs in the history of our Navy? Admiral Hayward was number 21. That's a pretty selective group. Admiral Hayward had a naval career that spanned 39 years. He served in World War II, the Korean War, and Vietnam. Since retiring from the Navy and settling in Seattle, he has been very involved in the education of our youth. In fact, to honor some of his work, a school was named after him in Vietnam. <laughs> Admiral Hayward is renowned for his leadership in times of war and peace and respected as an exceptional individual in the service of his country and his community. He has devoted his life to service, to serving his country in war, and serving his fellow man in times of peace. Think about how fortunate we, in this room, are today. Today, in one room, we have two of the greatest leaders and military men in the history of the United States, Admiral Hayward In one room, we have Admiral Hayward and General Mattis. We will all one day in the future talk about this night. In a world that seems more chaotic, unseemly, rude, and disrespectful every day, we have two men with all of the poise, dignity, and class anyone could ever hope for. What amazing role models they are for us and for the country. These men are national treasures and American heroes. Tonight, I have this distinct honor of presenting the 2019 Champion of Freedom Award to Admiral Tom Hayward. But because there is so much to say about this remarkable man, and too much for any one person to cover it all, we have assembled a few people that he has impacted over the years to help us. Let me call your attention to the video screens. I grew up in the uh, Depression years, and the war started at the end, end of those years, and um, I signed up in the Navy and spent the next 39 years doing it. He joined the Navy uh, a couple of years before I did. I was in one year, and, and he, he went much, much, much long, longer, and uh, he is just very modest about it all. For the whole Navy, uh, he's never going to be forgotten. He's one of the landmark CNOs in our history, and I don't think there's any question that he's a champion of freedom. When he was a, an aviator, he was a good one. He had five, nearly 500 carrier takeoffs, 498 carrier landings. It's a story that it's worth asking him about. <laughs> People think leaders are born, a lot of people do. That's not really true. Uh, I've seen so many people of all qualities just work hard at the problem. So it's uh, intensity, it's uh, commitment, it's um, role models, uh, uh, living up to what you believe in, uh, holding the people accountable, and then holding yourself accountable. Admiral Hayward uh, became the Chief of Naval Operations, the top officer in the Navy uh, in the 1970s, which was one of the most challenging decades uh, the Navy's ever gone through. We were coming out of the Vietnam War, uh, the budgets were being cut, we had a huge maintenance backlog, and we were faced with the challenge of fixing the ships we had and modernizing the Navy at the same time. First time I met President Reagan was uh along uh, Pennsylvania Avenue on the day of his inauguration. As you know, the parades come by, all the services come by, marching and so forth. 
So I stood up by the president, and he watched these sailors trying to figure out how to march. And he turned to me and he said, you got a lot of work to do, Admiral. He leads by example. Uh, he's actually a, an inspiration to me in, uh, in several ways. Uh, as I've heard it said about Admiral Hayward, he does what he says he's going to do. In my parlance, that uh, he makes and keeps commitments. And then he is uh, the ultimate community member, uh, and he cares about those around him and wants to add value to where he is. When Peace Trees Vietnam started, he was instrumental in getting the organization not only off the ground, but advice around where to go, how to go about it. His grasp is so clear, and his commitment is so strong to supporting particularly the children their well-being, their education, through school, building their kindergarten, and supporting children of landmine survivors. So 110,000 landmines and other kinds of uh, bombs have been removed, and there have been a number of schools built, as well as libraries, of which one is in his name. He's a tremendous friend to Peace Trees. He's a visionary to see that the impossible can become the possible. His days are full, and I would say by noon, he's done more than many Americans have done all day. Oh, he's definitely a champion of freedom, but he's also a champion of global education. So I couldn't imagine a more uh, important person to receive this award than Admiral Tom Hayward. I think he's as fine a patriot as you find in this country. I'm very honored to have him as a friend. What makes the United States worth defending? 200 plus odd years of people sacrificing for us. Uh, the greatest form of government there is, ever has been. And we got to live up to it and uphold it, support it, give your life if necessary, commit yourself. That's my, uh, that's my thesis. For Admiral Tom Hayward, in grateful recognition of your 39 years of service in the United States Navy and for your courageous leadership in protecting freedom and advancing market principles that have improved education opportunities in our great nation and around the world, we award you our Champion of Freedom Award tonight, October 24th, in Spokane, Washington. Congratulations. Thanks, Dan and Phil. <clears throat> All of you wonderful people from the red part of the state. Yeah. Whew. It's pretty hard stuff to absorb. <laughs> and uh, in the presence of two giant leaders, a great governor and fabulous general, <laughs> Really, I'm embarrassed to be a present in your sight. You guys are so strong. Wonderful thing. How, how about that food we have? My friends up there, close friends. <clears throat> and that crazy old guy jumping out of a perfectly good airplane <laughs> on his 95th birthday. I thought that was a big deal, <laughs> and, and I was real proud of it until an hour ago. I asked General Mattis how many times, you know, dozens of times more than I. 
and he had a 50 to 75 pound combat package on his back and I had this great big strong massive guy <laughs> holding on to me he had over 10,000 jumps I felt sort of safe <laughs> and God bless you all for this evening and uh, being part of, uh, of this organization I would say that the general and I have a lot of different backgrounds and but at the same time, we have something so much in common that um, I've heard it from many of you tonight. You came up and said, thank you for your service. <clears throat> you know, we don't need to be thanked for your, our service. <clears throat> We've been privileged to serve you, this great country. And we also have in common a very strong bond with this organization because it stands for the very things that are so fundamental to America. Over 200 years of, of founding principles that are so right, freedom of speech, freedom of, re of religion, freedom to gather together to express opinions and disagree. And that's what the Washington Policy Center does so well and has done so much for all of us here in this state and it's growing and it'll keep growing as long as you keep writing on those tables Congratulations, Admiral. Indeed a pleasure. We have another special part of the evening planned for you right now, and that has to do with our keynote speaker, General Jim Mattis. Actually, we have a couple special announcements regarding General Mattis, one immediately following his remarks tonight, and one right now. Please welcome the Congressman from the 4th Congressional District representing Central Washington. He is also the former Director of the Washington Department of Agriculture, Dan Newhouse. Well, good evening, Eastern Washington. Now, wait a minute. I know not all of you are from Eastern Washington, but hello, Eastern Washington. Thank you. I know that because I rode over on, from Seattle and Alaska Airlines with some of you, but, you know, it's a, it's a delight and truly an honor to be here with you to, to, to this evening. But just as importantly, I'm having a lot of fun, too. What about you guys? This is good. It's good. It's, it truly is a, a, a great occasion, not, not only to see so many friends, but also to see so many great community leaders all in one room here to, to get together to celebrate and reflect upon those things that we think are important and those things that bring us together, our common ideals and our aspirations for our communities and our state and certainly for our nation. I want to thank the uh, Washington Policy Center for making this possible, but I mostly want to thank all of you for being here and making this a success. So give yourselves a hand for coming out tonight. It truly is a special night when we have the likes of Governor Chris Christie. Governor, you know this is Seahawk territory, I gotta tell you, but, but uh, you, you truly are a beacon of hope for us. You know, we think we're pretty blue, but New Jersey, I think you might have a little bit up on us. But just to put the record straight, it's been since 1980 that we've elected a Republican governor. It's, a long, it's not quite as bad as 1972 for you, but we're close. We're close. Admiral Hayward, thank you, sir, for allowing us to be here and witness the, the honor that you so justly deserve. Thank you, sir.
And certainly I'd be remiss if I didn't at least recognize my colleague, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers, for all of her tremendous service. And certainly all of our distinguished guests, uh, elected officials, all of you tonight are certainly special people. But for me, I couldn't be more, more delighted to have the pleasure of introducing your next speaker. And I know you want to listen to him more, th more so than me. So le but le just let me tell you a couple things. First of all, all of my constituents are special. I have the honor of representing what I think is the best congressional district in the state, the fourth congressional district. It's a privilege and an honor to represent the people of central Washington and Washington, D.C. And I'm proud of every single one of my constituents. But, but certainly, I've got to say, maybe one that I'm most proud of is your next speaker, Mr. Jim Mattis. He truly is someone to be proud of. Did, did I mention he's my constituent? Did I say that? <laughs> Let me make sure. He's truly one of Washington State's finest and most distinguished native sons. He was born in Pullman. where I spent four years of my life, as many of you did. He was raised in Richland, the Tri-Cities area, and was educated in Ellensburg. So I would say that qualifies Mr. Mattis as being a Washingtonian through and through, wouldn't you? So. What can you say? An impeccable military career, which truly spans every facet of learning and accomplishment within the United States Marine Corps. A record of dedicated leadership, including commanding, uh, this is a long list, so bear with me, commanding the U.S. Joint Forces Command, NATO's Supreme Allied Command for Transformation, the U.S. Central Command, and of course, recently, as you all know, the Department of Defense. But I would bet you that he would agree, most importantly, he has been able to command the deepest degree of trust, of respect, and admiration earned truly second to none amongst the men and women serving our country in uniform across the globe. <clears throat> this is someone this is someone who's been at the forefront of growing and maintaining our strength, of our alliances, and our global stability, all in order to ensure that peace endures. And yet, I and I know many of you have seen firsthand a very humble man. He's going to deny this if we give him a chance, but let me tell you that he is truly a special person Be for a lot of reasons, but because, I think, of the way that he can communicate and truly resonate and more, very much more importantly, be listened to. And I've seen this myself personally. From heads of state, to members of Congress, where sometimes it's hard to get their attention, he can do that. To business leaders, to military officers, all the way down to the grunts. People listen to this man. I've seen him connect with students, high school and college students, young business leaders. He has that unique ability to connect with people and to teach. And I know that we will all learn something by listening to him all of us will very shortly. But <clears throat> before I turn the microphone over to him, I'd like to make an announcement this evening. <clears throat> I'd like to share with you my plans to recognize the truly distinguished career in the public service of General Mattis. You guys are in on this is the first time ever that anybody's going to know about this. When Congress goes back into session next Monday, 
I, along with my entire delegation of the state of Washington, on a bipartisan basis of the, of the U.S. House of Representatives, they'll be joining me introducing legislation to award General James Mattis the Congressional Gold Medal. Now, I won't tell you I disobeyed a direct order, but it was close. <laughs> I'm not sure, General, but I may just about out outrank you, too. So. But seriously, um, many of you are, but some of you may not be totally aware of, a, of exactly what this award is. award is. It's the highest honor that the United States Congress can bestow. And let me tell you, it's, it's not something that's handed out very often. And it truly, very, it is truly very difficult to get signed into law. It's been bestowed about, upon some of the greatest generals that we've seen, some of the greatest leaders this country, and the greatest thinkers that this country has seen throughout our history. Let me just throw a few names out. It, the list of awardees includes people like George Washington, Ulysses S. Grant, General Douglas MacArthur, President Harry Truman. So I want you to know that, as this is the first time I'm making this announcement, that I'm going to be working along with my colleagues very, very hard to ensure that General Mattis is the next distinguished leader to receive the Congressional Gold Medal. <clears throat> And let me just quote one line out of the legislation that we've prepared. And I quote this. In recognition of his distinguished military career, his steadfast moral character and patriotism, and his unyielding devotion to the protection of this nation, I believe General James Mattis belongs amongst the giants of American exceptionalism. So... It is my distinct honor and my sincere pleasure to introduce to you someone who has used this and has been referred to as this, no better friend and no worse enemy. <laughs> and did I mention he's also my constituent? Did I say that? <laughs> okay. My friend, Jim Mattis. Thank you. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> and thank you, Congressman Newhouse. Uh, I'm not sure about your judgment, but I admire your courage. Uh, but that's very generous. Thank you. And we'll see how it turns out, sir. Uh, but I'm humbled by it. It is good to be back with all of you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with the Washington Policy Center. I will tell you that you're admired far and wide. Uh, I have seen your data, believe it or not, quoted up in New England when I was up there on a completely different issue a couple years ago. And I was so proud to look up in the midst of a rather boring uh, lunch that I was trying to stay awake in and see tax data cited from the Washington Policy Center as an argument for what they were trying to do up there. Uh, so it was really quite interesting. And it's good to hear that Ottawa is going to get a lesson from Washington Policy Center as well. But I say that uh, with all seriousness because generally these kind of state policy organizations are known at best in their own state. Many aren't even known there. And for you to be known beyond your own, uh, your own boundaries, that, that really says something about this, uh, about this outfit's reputation. Uh, I'm grateful to join you all in what would probably be the primary city of the eastern side of the state, although there's some others that would resent that, uh, including where I'm from. Uh, I especially want to welcome those of you who traveled from the west side. Uh, as you came over Snoqualmie, that yellow orb up in the sky, that's the sun. Uh, 
Uh, we see a lot of that over here. Here, uh, this is this is where this is heaven on earth. By the way, that's how come uh, Governor Christie came all this far to see us. Uh, you know, I'm proud of of being from this part of the state. I, I couldn't leave it until I was. Uh, about 21, and the draft was coming, uh, so a little bit of a motivation there. Uh, but I did, uh, I did pick up my values here, and what I picked up in this part of the world uh, allowed me to wander the rest of the world, but then come happily home to eastern Washington. Uh, Governor Christie, I'll just tell you, sir, uh, the la last time we saw each other was at the White House Christmas party, and that young lady went home just smiling to Texas with that picture that you took of us. Uh, so I'd uh, just like you to just grab the camera, reach in, and, and make someone feel like they were actually, they actually were important in a place where she was obviously overawed. But you mentioned that we don't know what's going to happen in 2020. You and I that night didn't know what was going to happen four days later, actually, did we? <laughs> but, uh, but we shared a lot of laughs. That's something you're well known for, sir, because you've carried that joyful attitude into every lion's den that you happily charged into. Yeah, we saw it here tonight as you gave us a Ph.D. level lecture on political leadership. And thank you for reminding us that one man, one woman in America can make a difference. <laughs> but one point I would also make is I think the good Lord forgot to do an environmental impact statement on you when they made you a politician. <laughs> because uh, I think they might have said that's not a... That's probably a pretty risky thing to put him down on the planet Earth for a certain period of time. I can't be up here, ladies and gentlemen, on this dais uh, alongside uh, the man who was CNO, the Chief of Naval Operations, when I was an infantry company commander with three different deployments to the Western Pacific, the Indian Ocean, and the Persian Gulf. Uh, he is a hero to the sailors and Marines and the fleet. Uh, it is sometimes hard, and you'll understand this, when you get to very high rank in any organization, <clears throat> and certainly in the military with its tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, for one admiral or one general to be really known, to really make a difference uh, way down through all the, the levels of command. <clears throat> but it was not so for this admiral. Uh, we knew who he was. We knew he enlisted in World War II. Uh, we knew he had taken over 146 combat missions into North Korea as a pilot. And that's running the odds pretty steep, ladies and gentlemen. 146, you're running the odds awfully steep. Uh, he was repeatedly decorated for valor. In Vietnam service, he was the commanding officer of all the aircraft and air crew on board an aircraft carrier. And then he went back as the CEO of the USS America, one of the finest ships in the Navy in its day. And he then moved on to the 7th Fleet and who we put in command of our, our numbered fleets, the, the fighting fleets. Those are our warriors. And he also became the Pacific Fleet Commander before he became our Chief of Naval Operations. And the, the, he was a warrior first, always a warrior. Uh, he's a very fierce one. He knows how to fight. But he's also a very ethical warrior. And he brought the Navy out of the doldrums of a very difficult period. He matched tradition to innovation. He was an inspiration to every one of us. And I think uh, it, was, it was humbling to have you say we have a lot in common, Admiral, but I agree with you. It was a privilege every time we got to fight for this country. And uh, it was a pleasure, I might add, to fight as part of the Navy, uh, Navy Marine team when you were the Chief of Naval Operations. Ladies and gentlemen, his name alone is his passport to the trust of every sailor and Marine in the fleet. We knew we could count on him. The reason was we knew he cared about us. Then we knew how much he knew. But he cared about every one of us down there, and we knew that. Same time, he was hard on us. We knew we had to stand and deliver when it was our turn. And his devotion to duty at the risk of his life meant he could look us in the eye and expect 100 percent from us. So I would just tell you, uh, Admiral, you represent what all the veterans in the room turned for the goodness and the commitment to our nation. And I just I can't thank you enough for your example of moral leadership at a time when our naval service really needed that to come out of some tough times. So thanks you very much, Admiral. You know, 
we all, we all talk about what we owe the vets, and we have a sense that what we owe the veterans is the freedom that we enjoy, and certainly that's true. But when you go to high rank also, that's when you really become aware on a personal basis how much we owe our veterans uh, in this country. One night, I'd been ordered to attack a town that had been seized by the enemy, and I was down talking to the assault troops. It's about midnight. <clears throat> talking to them about what they were going to be doing, how we were going to go against this, this very uh, well-dug-in enemy. And it's about midnight. It's time for generals to get out of the way and, and let the young men get ready to do what they have to do. And as we were falling back with my half-dozen radio operators, uh, the enemy made a problem behind one of the assault units. It was laying shivering there in the desert waiting for the clock to tick down for them to attack. And so I checked in with the corporal. He said that he would, uh, he'd take care of it, and they did. They calmed things down there, and everything was quiet. And some of the Marines, thinking I'd moved on, one of them asked his boss, the corporal, the 22-year-old, Corporal, do you think Fallujah is going to be tough in the morning? And the corporal, because we have ladies here, I won't use quite the same language the corporal used, but he basically said, hush and get some sleep. We took Iwo Jima. Fallujah won't be nothing. Now you think about that, these young sailors and marines laying on the line of departure ready to assault, and they weren't even alive when Iwo Jima was taken, and yet the example, the raw, unadorned example of our veterans coming down to them gave them the, the courage to know that nothing they were going to do was going to be tougher than Iwo Jima, so just hang in there, listen to your NCOs, and do the job. So what we owe our veterans, everyone in here, no matter where they served, is this sense to the young men and women today, they'll never be asked to do something tougher than Shiloh, than Bella Wood, than Vietnam Admiral. It'll never be tougher than that. And that example is why this big, great big experiment you and I call America continues to exist. That example that we can win when it's toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy and the example set for our veterans. So a round of applause for all the veterans, please. Now, I am, of course, honored to be singled out for the Columbia Award, uh, the name of this award. It's named for a river I swam in every summer. I grew up right on the banks of the Columbia there in Richland. Yet you'll understand as a military man whose reputation is built largely, nearly totally, on the blood, sweat, and tears of others, often very, very young, uh, very junior troops, and on the sacrifices of our never-to-be-forgotten Gold Star families and what they've paid. Humility is the only proper reference point that I can have to get recognized because I didn't earn this. And that's not false modesty. That's a reality you and I know is true. And I would just point out here that, thank you, but for the veterans to the NCOs and the petty officers, the junior officers, the senior officers who got me out of every single jam I got them into, uh, I just, I'm, I'm grateful to them. And that's why I'm standing up here tonight and I'm so proud of them because what I can represent to you is what they did. And that is the honest to God truth. <clears throat> and the fact is, because it's a privilege, because it's such a privilege to fight for this country, many of the troops too are able to keep their sense of humor about it. And when they keep their sense of humor, you know they're going to keep their sense of ethics. You know they're going to keep themselves balanced even when they have to do very tough things. I walked up behind a squad fighting in Ramadi one day. It was a terrible time. We were losing troops all over. And I walked up behind this, this dozen sailors and Marines fighting in the street against an enemy. And I said to them, I asked the single most inane question that's been asked in the illustrious 240-year history of the Marine Corps of a combat leader. I said, hey, guys, what's going on? <laughs> and the corporal uh, convinced that some village somewhere had lost its duty idiot, <laughs> dropped his rifle from his shoulder and looked over at me and said, well, General, we're just taking the fun out of fundamentalism over here. <laughs> I tell you, you know, uh, the only reason I stuck around that low-paying outfit 
The only reason I stuck around that low-paying outfit so long was for the absolute pleasure of serving alongside those rambunctious young patriots there. <clears throat> I would point out in the spirit of this evening, uh, Mr. President, uh, the spirit of service to our magnificent experiment that we call America, I have to thank the Washington Policy Center for its very generous donation, a very generous donation to a wounded fund that specifically goes to help some of the most grievously wounded sailors and Marines that we have who've lost limbs, been blinded, etc. And I just want to thank all of you for that because I'm reminded I wasn't in the Marine Corps for 40-some years. I was in the U.S. Marine Corps. We belong to you, accountable to you, and it just shows the ownership you take of us that the Washington Policy Center would commit that. Dan, thanks so much. You know, I spoke here once before. Uh, I think I was the warm-up act uh, for Charles Krauthammer, if I remember right. But I, I just have to tell you, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, that wonderful guy. But uh, I am grateful, uh, Mr. President, for your team inviting me back. Because, ladies and gentlemen, after some of the things I've said in public, uh, probably not even as colorful as, as uh, our governor here tonight, uh, but even then, I'm not often invited back to speak in front of polite company, so thank you. <laughs> Something about coming home where they always have to take you in. Um, but uh, I think also, in a more serious vein, Washington Policy Center does something we need very badly right now in our country. Uh, and I, I think in a time when government can often seem very remote or disconnected, we're a big country now, we're much bigger than when we were founded, uh, in a time when the government can seem to be offering 20th century solutions to 21st century problems, uh, in a time when our political, uh, our political life, it just seems to ignore what it unites us often, what unites us as Americans, choosing to focus only on the issues that divide. It's groups like this that can create hard issue policy positions that then can unite people by the logic, by the persuasiveness of the argument for that policy. I think in such a time that this policy center offers a different path forward, one with a rigorous effort to define problems and a willingness to propose new ideas that are both viable but sustainable. Sometimes we have people with great ideas, but they're not sustainable ideas. They're not going to work in the long run. And I think that they have the courage here to bring options to the table consistent with our debt to the next generation to whom we owe such leadership, to whom we owe those solutions. And we need to be reminded at this point in our national life that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people can actually govern itself in the best interest of the people. Because right now, if we look at the UK with Brexit, the problems France has in the streets, look at Germany right now, Look at Australia, look at Canada. There's a lot of challenges for the democracies. We need a model that says this can work. We need to be reminded that we can and should be heard from on all issues as well. Too often we leave things to others and then we get angry about what's going on and it's all because we didn't get engaged like the Washington Policy Center allows us to engage because you must organize if you're going to engage in this world. It does not require us, however, to be hard on each other. Be hard on the issues, beat on the table, hammer out the issues, hammer out the policy. But let's remember that the fellow American with whom we may be disagreeing right now today may actually be right about some things and make sure we keep an open mind and we work together because the younger generation is counting on us to come up with the best policies. And to you young people, thank you. And to you young people in the room, it's hard. I didn't understand it myself when old people would talk like this. But when you get, when you get hair my color, you start looking at the young people and you say, God, I really want to do something good for these young people. I want to turn this over in, in good shape. And you're going to hear sometimes nowadays people who mock those who are in government, who go off and run for office, or they, they're the bureaucrats who try to make things work. Uh, and they belittle those who work in government and I call those people refugees from responsibility. You know what that is? You know, they, they don't want the responsibility themselves, but they're willing to make fun of those who are in there trying to make the thing work. 
Uh, it's as if they think that all the freedoms that we have, that we enjoy, uh, they were gained and sustained just out of thin air, that they just happened to happen. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, this freedom to think as we please, to say what we please, to go where we please. Uh, Go Governor Christie noted that those freedoms came from sacrifice. They came from real sacrifice. Uh, it, you know, like a chicken, you know, gives a donation, you know, an egg. But a, a pig makes a sacrifice when it gives up a ham, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, it grew out of the sacrifices of generations of patriots who were willing to sacrifice everything for the country. I mean, those people who signed the Declaration, every one of them was going to hang if King George caught them, if his army won. Every one of them was going to hang. They did pledge, pledge their lives for this experiment that we have still today. It sometimes takes a foreigner's view to remind us that America has sources of power unavailable to others. And the two sources I would, two fundamental sources I would cite one is the power of inspiration, one's the power of intimidation. Now, the military exists largely in the latter, the intimidation side. It's also an inspiration, but it's the one that says, if you mess with us, we're going to come after you. It's the one that, after 9-11, when some maniacs thought that if they could hurt us, they could scare us, and it was the U.S. military job to show we don't scare, and we went after them right afterwards. So we need that. We, we need that power of intimidation if we're going to keep this experiment alive. But at the same time, the power of inspiration, and I have a story about it that I, I always like to recall. I'm very fond of recalling. We were fighting out in western Euphrates River Valley area. It was 2004. In some of the areas, we were outnumbered. Some of you will remember names like Fallujah, Ramadi, al Qaim, Haditha. And I was traveling one night, had seven, 29 sailors and Marines with me. They went everywhere with me. And the fighting was so bad that over four months, I would see 17 of those 29 killed and wounded around me. And I was a general. I wasn't in the, I wasn't in the tough fighting. And we pulled in one night in the middle of the night out in the western Euphrates River Valley. And when the sun came up, here was a second lieutenant <clears throat> with about 40 sailors and Marines. And their job was to try to block the rat line coming in from Syria where the foreign fighters were going after Baghdad. And they had to go over hundreds of kilometers of desert to get through, and this was a platoon out there to stop it. And they'd caught a guy laying a mine the night before on the road I drove in on. Kind of personal. <laughs> <clears throat> but they were surprised to find that he spoke English, the guy who was laying it. They said, you want to talk to him? I said, sure, bring him over. So they brought him over. And he wasn't in real good shape. He was shaking pretty bad, and they cut his little plastic handcuffs off, and we sat down on the ground together inside this perimeter in the middle of nowhere. And I said, what are you doing this for? You're Sunni. We're the Marines. We're the only friends you've got out here. What are you doing this for? And he started on, on that ignorant kind of stuff. Oh, you're, you Jews, you Americans, you're here to steal the oil. And I said, forget that. You know, just, you're an educated man. Go away. I don't have time for this sort of thing. And the Marine stepped forward to, to take him away, and the, the guard, and he said, can I sit here for a minute? I said, sure. So he's sitting there and uh, got him a cup of coffee. He's shaking so bad he could hardly hold it and stuff. You know, it had been a bad night for him. He's out there with his wheelbarrow. He's got two artillery rounds. He's got a car battery digging a hole. And uh, next thing you know, he looks up, and there's five guys with automatic weapons standing around him, and they're not his, his guys. Uh, so he knew at that point his retirement plan was in jeopardy. And he finally tells me, I just don't like having foreign soldiers in my country. Well, I can respect that. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want that in Spokane. So we talk a little bit. Where's your family? Down on the river. Uh, got a wife, two kids, two daughters, and everything. And finally, uh, it's about time for him to go. And he says, uh, General, I got a question. He said, am I, uh, am I going to jail? I said, oh, yeah, you're lucky you're not dead for that little stunt, but you're going to be wearing an orange jumpsuit. Uh, down in Abu Ghraib prison for a long time. I want you to listen to what he said next. He said, General, do you think if I'm a model prisoner, someday my family and I could immigrate to America? <laughs> now think about that. A guy literally committed to fighting us, to killing us if he could, 
and the power of inspiration of America can reach clear over to the western Euphrates River Valley, and he would love to be sitting right where you are tonight, his two daughters in school in Spokane, Washington. It's a reminder to us on our worst day, ladies and gentlemen, let's not forget just how great it is to be Americans. And I think, I think we have to remember, too, it's our responsibility to turn over this country to the next generation in as good a shape or better than we found it. Now, the actual word for that I first found in Thomas Jefferson's papers is called usufruct. And let me tell you, I didn't touch a drop of wine tonight before I said that word, and you know why, okay? But basically, in agricultural terms, and we're in an agricultural part of the country here, it means you can chop down the trees, you can change the water course, plant crops, <clears throat> do whatever you want with the land, but you must turn it over to your daughter or your son in as good a shape or better than you received it. And I have to ask the people with my color hair here tonight, <clears throat> are we turning over this country in as good a shape or better than we received it when we were the luckiest generation because we were raised by the greatest generation in our country? It's a question that keeps me awake sometimes at night. I would just ask that we all keep faith in our often chaotic, ram raucous, and sometimes rambunctious democracy. Uh, keep faith in the Constitution. Remember George Washington's Revolutionary Army marched out of the disaster of Valley Forge, tougher than ever, tougher than petrified woodpecker lips. Uh, they came out and they humbled a Napoleon, a, an army, the British Army, that would, that would defeat Napoleon a few years later. There was nothing certain that we were going to end up with this country. That was based on the sacrifices that Governor Christie related earlier. And I think we have to keep the faith, and let me just close with a few words about that military that is going to keep the faith right now. The, we have by choice, uh, we have by choice accepted an all-volunteer military. And that's, that's important. That's good. It's been very good for, for our military to have all volunteers there. But it's also going to need more than just the support of the Congress, which we do have. It's going to need the support of educators and parents. It's going to need the support of businessmen, large and small. It's going to need the support of community leaders and our spiritual leaders as well. Because our all-volunteer military is a national treasure, but it isn't just up to the Army sergeant down at the mall to find the recruits, the high-quality recruits. Right now in America, 71 percent of our 18 to 24-year-olds cannot qualify to be a private in the U.S. Army, the baseline of service. This needs all of our help and all of our attention because we sit here safe tonight without a care in the world in Spokane, Washington. But we do so because on the other side of the world, uh, where uh, we have troops deployed right now, they're going on patrol, they're keeping the enemy on the back foot, they're helping the French Army do it down in the Lake Sahal or Lake Chad, Sahal area of Africa. This is all going on, and it all comes down to these high-quality young volunteers. And I would just ask that all of us, in order to keep our military all volunteer, we do our part and make certain that service to communities, service to schools, and service to the nation, service, 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 becomes part of our ethos in everything we do. I think every time I'm thanked for my service, and all of us veterans have been, it's a remarkable country today. Uh, it makes me a little uncomfortable. I don't know what to say about it because it was a privilege. Uh, I can say thank you for thanking me. That seems mechanical. I can say you're welcome. That seems a little brittle. But I had, like much uh, as an infantry officer, much of what I was trained to do and taught to do was by NCOs. I had a young Marine Corporal Kyle Carpenter tell me what's the best thing to say in return. And he is the youngest Medal of Honor winner or person who have earned the Medal of Honor alive today. And the young corporal said, what I tell them now is, you're worth it. You're worth it. And what a great reply. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I don't care who you voted for. I don't care whether you're male or female or you declare you're something else. I don't understand all that. Um, <laughs> 
I don't care what race you're, you are, I don't care what religion you are, believe me, I never doubted your worth every day of those 40 some odd years that I spent uh, wearing the uniform of the country. I was privileged and humbled to do so. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for honoring me tonight, and I will pass what you have done for me to every troop I ever see until the day I die, saying the country recognizes you via me, and the country's worth it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Secretary Mattis, that was outstanding. Thank you for joining us. I should mention he gave us credit for that contribution to Semper Fi Fund. We did that because in lieu of his honorarium tonight that all speakers receive, he waived it and recommended we give it to Semper Fi Fund. That takes care of our wounded veterans. So thank you. So I just... I would just like to read the uh, 2019 Columbia Award to General James N. Mattis, USMC retired, to a native Washingtonian in grateful recognition of your courageous leadership and years of service to the United States Marine Corps and as Secretary of Defense in protecting freedom, creating peace, and advancing American interests around the world. Presented at the 2019 Policy Center Annual Dinner, Spokane, Washington, October 24, 2019. Well, that was something. <laughs> What a special evening. I think we're all going to be talking about this one for quite some time. General Mattis, congratulations, and thank you so much for your service. We appreciate it. Admiral Hayward, thank you as well, and congratulations, sir. <laughs> Governor Christie, our thanks for your work in New Jersey and for joining us tonight. We're going to work on that Cowboys thing. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, too, a reminder, too, that both gentlemen have books available. We've mentioned uh, Governor Christie's, and they were, will be uh, staying around after the event tonight to sign books at the Barnes and Noble table. They're going to try and sign as many as possible. So um, sign up in, or line up in an orderly fashion so we can get through as many people as possible. It has been a wonderful evening. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and for the good work of Washington Policy Center to continue. Of course, we need your support, so please fill out those pledge cards and place it in the red envelope on your table. There are big challenges ahead in this uh, state, and WPC is going to need your help to face them, so please fill out your card now. Your contributions, reminder, are tax deductible and will help get the Free Markets Create campaign off on the right foot. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll see you next year.